Good morning, Grace. Good morning, visitors. We're going to stand and we're going to worship today. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone. Just one, just 
That is our prayer today, that we would trust you in everything that we have, place our fears into your hands. Lord, thank you for all that you do for us, all that you have done and all that you will do. Lord, we love you. We praise you today. Thank you so much for our visitors. Thank you so much for our staff. Thank you so much for the students who are here today and that we would just hear you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Grace College. We have guests today. Can we muster up just a little bit more energy? Good morning, Grace College. Yes, I promise. We, we usually have a lot more energy than that. Uh, good morning. My name is Nathan. I serve as the Vice President of Advancement here at Grace College and Seminary. Uh, we have a Lancer Day. How many guests do we have here today? If you don't mind raising your hand, extroverts are raising their hand, introverts are slinking down. We are so grateful that you all are here with us today. Honestly, I was telling Brent beforehand, I'm so grateful that we get to bring guests to chapel uh, because here at Grace College, we say that we are a Christ-centered institution. And we don't just say that, but we mean it. And chapel is one of the tangible ways that we get to live out our calling that the Lord has given us to know Christ and to make him known. So thank you that you are here with us today. Now, I have the privilege of introducing our chapel speaker today, Daniel Renner. Uh, last year, I was traveling in Ohio meeting with a alumni and friends of our institution. And I got to sit down and have coffee with Daniel. And uh, I did not know him before having coffee. And I left feeling like I had gained a really good friend. And uh, as someone who previously had pastored, I loved sitting down with him and talking and saying, man, tell me about your call to ministry. Tell me about your philosophy of preaching and teaching. Talk to me about discipleship. And Daniel went on and on and on and opened up his heart to me of what the Lord has called him to do. And I left encouraged knowing that we got to play a part in that in training and sending him out. So let me give you a little bit of bio on Daniel. He is a 2019 Grace graduate. He's been on staff at Grace Fellowship in Columbus since 2019. By the way, go Buckeyes. He is, uh, that came with mixed review. Do I need to play that down? Oh, sorry. Go Buckeyes. Anyway, so he has been on the teaching team since 2022. Daniel leads the Commons, the young adult ministry at Grace Fellowship. And I want to say this, if, if I lived near Columbus, and I, I guess I was still considered a young adult at that point, if I lived there, I'd want Daniel to be my pastor. Uh, the man has a heart for Jesus, and I'm excited for you to hear him today as he preaches from John 6. But most importantly, Daniel is married to Nina, and they have a two-year-old son named Abe. How cute is that? Abe. That's awesome. Grace, let's give him a welcome. Thank you, Dr. Harris. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, good morning, Grace. How are you? Yeah, good. Good. Normally, I make my church say that twice because the first good morning is normally not that good, but you guys did okay. I want to say uh, just thank you to, to you guys here. Thank you to Dr. Harris. Thank you uh, to Dr. Flame for allowing me this opportunity. And thank you to Brent uh, for reaching out and just asking me to come uh, share this with you this morning. Now, Brent told me I had uh, freedom to talk about whatever I want. So I've got a 30-minute presentation this morning on how Winona Lake needs to catch up with the times and get a Chipotle somewhere within <laughs> campus. It's about time. It's about time. Too many trips for me when I was in school driving to Fort Wayne just to get a burrito. But no, in, in all seriousness, uh, what, what I'm sharing today is, is, to be honest with you, something that, that God has really been working in, in my heart on over the last couple months. Um, wh what I want to share with you right now is, is something that if I could go back to my time at, at Grace College and, and sit down and share a meal with the past version of me, this is what I would share with me. And I know that for all of you, you probably don't know me and I just get a, an introduction. You've got to trust that, that I'm uh, someone who you should listen to. And, and this morning, I, I want to just, with all the honesty in my soul, say to you that I, I think what we're going to open up the pages of the Bible and talk about today is something that applies to you, applies to you right now. And it's something that I think has the power to change your life uh, in a really significant way. I know um, that we're finishing up the school year 
here in just a couple weeks. I was actually asking Brent earlier this week, how with it are the students? Like, are they moved on to, to summer? Are they done with school? Do they not want to be in chapel? And he said, no, they're still pretty connected. They still are really uh, engaged during chapel and all that kind of stuff. But I know in a few short weeks, you, your school year will end. And for most of you, your, your education will continue. But for some of you, your graduation happens and you'll start a job sometime this summer. For, for others of you, you'll finish the school year. You'll move back home for a couple months. Some of you, your engagement is about to turn into a wedding. Some of you, you're going to do an internship. You're going to start a new job. Some of you will move back home and live in your parents' basement and do nothing all summer long. But all of us, all of us, here's the deal. All of us have something that we're about to step into. All of us have a next thing that is coming in your life. And here's what I know. All of us, regardless of whatever's next for you, regardless of what the next step in your life's journey is, you're probably looking forward to it. You probably are looking longingly at the thing that is about to come. And I think that's just something we do, right? Whatever, whatever season we're about to step into, whatever the next thing is for us, our hope is that the next thing will be better than the thing that we're currently experiencing. No one looks at me and would say, Daniel, I'm about to finish school and, and I hope my summer's just bad. Like I hope that my girlfriend dumps me. I hope that I don't get the job that I was wanting. I hope that my family life is rough. I, don't that, I hope that I don't get accepted to that apartment that I wanted to be in. And I hope that I come back to school next year and it's worse than this past year has been. We don't say that. That would be crazy. We want stuff to be better. We want whatever's coming down the road to be better than what is in our life right now. Some of you, you, you would say, man, I, I know that right now in my life, I feel a little bit uneasy. I feel a little bit uneasy. Maybe you would say, I don't just feel uneasy, I feel a little bit anxious about where I'm at in life right now. And you would look forward and you would say, but I, I think that thing that's coming next, I think that thing will be good. And, and here's what I know. We don't just do this during our college years. I lead a young adult ministry, by the way, uh, young adult at our church is 18 to 29. So there's a ton of stages of life within that reality. And here's what I know. The people that I sit down with, I do a lot of counseling with the young adults of our church. And I sit down with them and a lot of times they're sharing with me like really, really, really heavy stuff. They'll say things like, Daniel, I just lost my job again. Or I'm really struggling in my singleness right now. Or my home life is miserable. Or my boss, Daniel, if you just knew my boss, you would know that it's okay that I do all the rest of the stuff that I do. And they sit down there and they pour their heart out to me and they talk to me about what they're currently going through and the uneasiness that they feel in their soul and the anxiousness that they feel in life and the fact that they don't feel settled and they don't feel fulfilled and they've got all these longings that they're trying to find in their life and satisfy. And then they'll share all this stuff with me and then we get towards the end of the conversation and I'll talk about what's next. And so oftentimes this is how these conversations go. Yeah, Daniel, I'm, I'm really struggling right now, but but I got this new thing coming and I think once that happens, I think I'll be okay. I'm about to start a new job here in the next couple months and I think when I start a new job, all the uneasiness that I feel will be settled. I'm about to enter into, Daniel, there's this, there's this girl at my group and I know that if I can just start a relationship with her, the rest of everything will just fall into place. Daniel, the, the season that I'm about to step into, I, I know, I just feel like it's actually going to satisfy the longings and the desires that I have in my life right now. This is how the conversations go. We, we look forward to what's next. And we don't just have like a hopeful optimism about what's coming, that it's going to be better. What we're actually doing in those seasons and in those moments is we're saying, I actually think what's next is going to satisfy my life. I think what's coming down the road is going to be the thing that finally, once I can grab it, whatever it is for you, then I'll feel restful in my soul. Then I'll feel like my life is fulfilled. Then I'll feel like I won't be uneasy anymore and my anxiousness will be gone and I'll finally start to enjoy life. But I won't get that way until I get what's next. And here's the dangerous thing about what's next. What's next is always around the corner. What's next is always coming down the road. And what's next is never something tangible. Well, what happens is we, we chase what's next because we want it to satisfy. We want it to fulfill. We want the longings of our heart to be satisfied with something. So we chase. We chase. Some of you right now, you're about to graduate school and you think that the thing that's going to satisfy you is your career. You're going to graduate. You're going to go get the job. You're going to work at the law firm. You're going to make enough money. You're going to start the thing that you think is going to be awesome and earn the respect of your parents and the respect of your peers. And you just think, if I can get that, I'll be good. Some of you, you're like, man, I, I just, I, I need to get married and I need to have a family and I need to buy a house and I need to start a family and have kids. And once I get that, I'll be good. Once I get whatever it is for me in my life, I'll be at ease. 
life will be okay. And come on, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see what's on the other end of that. We're surrounded by people every day who are chasing and chasing and chasing fulfillment and satisfaction and longings and desires, trying to fill their life with whatever's coming next down the road. And here's what you know and here's what I know. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the question I think we have to wrestle with at different points in our life is, is that really all that life is? Chasing what's next. Trying to satisfy the longings and desires that we have with whatever's coming down the road. I think there's a better way, Grace. If I could go back and, and talk to the senior version of Daniel Renner, who's getting ready to graduate, I would look at him and say, stop chasing. Stop chasing. There's a better way. So I, I want to go to a passage of scripture that, to be honest, has been really impactful for me in my life, really impactful, especially in the last couple of years. And it's John chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, you can go to John chapter 6. If not, the verses will be up on the screen. John chapter 6, we'll start in verse 25, but I'll give you a little bit of context. John chapter 6, starting in verse 25. Up to this point, um, there's some things that have happened recently in Jesus's life and in his ministry that you're probably familiar with, you're probably aware of. At the beginning of John chapter 6, Jesus does what is one of the most famous passages in scripture, one of the most famous miracles. He feeds the 5,000. He's got 5,000 people or so, probably even more than that in front of him. And he feeds them all with a couple loaves of bread and a couple fish, right? And then at the end of that miracle, after everybody's eaten and had their fill, Jesus' disciples, the people that were following with him, they are, they're all like, all right, we're going to get out of here. We're going to go to the other side of this lake, which was known as the Sea of Galilee. So they get in a boat and they cross the Sea of Galilee. And here's a fun fact for you. I actually didn't know this until recently. The Sea of Galilee is also known as the Sea of Tiberias. Shout out to my favorite Tiberius, Dr. Ratza. He's in the house. So Jesus' disciples, they watch him do this miracle, and then they get in a boat, they row across the Sea of Galilee, and they get to the other side at a place called Capernaum. But Jesus doesn't go with them. Jesus stays in the spot where he uh, fed the 5,000. We don't really know what Jesus did, but he probably went off to be by himself. He probably got away for a little bit. And then Jesus, doing what only Jesus can do, he's like, I'm going to go meet up with my disciples. And the scripture tells us his disciples had rowed several miles across the Sea of Galilee already. And Jesus is just like, well, I need to get over there. I can't call an Uber. So I'll just walk across the lake. So Jesus walks across the Sea of Galilee and ultimately gets into the boat with his disciples. And then they arrive at shore. And all the people who Jesus had just fed fed with the loaves and fishes the day before, they start looking for Jesus everywhere. And they're like, Jesus isn't here. Jesus isn't here. We need to go somewhere else. So they also get in boats and go to the other side of the lake to try and find Jesus. And that's where we pick up the story in verse 25. All these people are looking for Jesus. And in verse 25, it says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? This is a little bit like the paparazzi. The paparazzi is looking for the celebrity and finally they find him. And they're like, when did you get here? We didn't see you leave. Jesus doesn't tell them that he walked across the lake. Jesus actually starts to cut right to the heart of them. And he actually gets serious with them right away. Jesus, when did you get here? And then in verse 26, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you. You're looking for me not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Jesus says, I know why you're looking for me. I know why you're here. I know why you want to talk to me. And you don't want to talk to me because you saw a miraculous thing happen and you think, man, this guy, maybe he's special. Maybe he's worth following. Maybe he really does have secrets of life that I need to understand. Maybe there is something that this Jesus guy can teach me. He's like, that's not why you're here. I know why you're here. You're here because yesterday I satisfied the longing that you had in your stomach with real food. And you come back to me and you look at me and you say, Jesus, I'm here because I think you can offer me a free meal. I think you got a little bit more of that bread and that fish. And I'm here for that. He cuts straight to the heart of why they're trying to find him. Why they're trying to get a hold of Jesus. He says, you're not here because you love me. You're not here because you believe in me. You're here because you have a momentary longing in your stomach for food. And you think I can offer it to you. And so the passage goes on. Very truly, I tell you, you're not looking for me because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate your, the loaves and you had your fill. And then in verse 27, Jesus says, don't work for food that spoils. Don't work for food 
that spoils. He says, you're chasing me down. You got in a boat. You rode miles across the sea. You are working so hard for me to just give you a loaf of bread. And what, would, what good would a loaf of bread be for you? It would satisfy your lunchtime, but then you'd be hungry at dinner. He says, don't work for stuff in your life that is only going to satisfy you for a moment. He goes on and he says this in verse 29, or excuse me, um, at the end of verse 27. Don't work for food that spoils but for food that endures to to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. He says, you are looking for me. You are working so hard because you have a momentary longing in your life that you think I can satisfy. And then Jesus looks back and he says, stop trying to just satisfy the longings in your life with momentary things that you think will bring fulfillment and satisfaction. He says, Try to search in your life for the things that will bring you lasting fulfillment. Fulfillment that will last not just for a moment, not just for lunch, not just for dinner, but into the next day and into the next season. Things that will last when things are good and when things are not good. And then Jesus says those famous words. He says, and that's what I'm here to bring you. The son of man is here to bring you life that endures through eternal life. He says, that's what I have and that's what I can give you. And then in verse 28, they asked him, What must we do to do the work that God requires? Jesus, you've got this stuff. You can offer eternal life. You can offer longings that don't ever fade away. Jesus said, if you want that, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. Jesus says, if you want lasting fulfillment, If you want satisfaction that's more than just a momentary satisfaction of whatever you're feeling in your stomach that day, I can offer it to you. And the way that you get it is by believing in me. And now the people would have looked at him and said, believing in you, who are you? We we don't know you other than what you did for us the other day. Who are you and why should we believe in you? And so in verse 30, they said, so they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Verse 31, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're calling back to uh, something that honestly we just sang about in the first song that we sang tonight. The idea that the Israelite people, when they were following Moses into the wilderness, God delivered manna to them to eat. And manna is one of those weird things that we don't actually know what it is. In fact, manna translated into English literally means what is it. But they knew that it was food. They knew it was food. It was good for them to eat. And not only did they know it was good for them to eat, they they took it as a sign that they were supposed to be following Moses. They, they, They thought it was Moses who was the one who actually had bread rained down from heaven or manna rained down from heaven. And they said, okay, well, because Moses has done this, we should probably follow him. And Jesus corrects them very quickly. He says in verse 32, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. It was my father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus says it wasn't Moses who fed them. You got it twisted. It was God. God came in and said, I'll give you what you need for today. I'll satisfy your longings and desires today. And then he says, but there's real bread. There's real bread that brings lasting satisfaction and it comes from God. And again, if if someone was sitting in front of you offering you lasting satisfaction that would never fade, you would probably look back and say, I want some of that. In verse 34, uh, the people respond. They said, sir, always give us this bread. Insert, get this bread joke right here. We're chasing the bread today. They were chasing the bread back then. They said, if Jesus has something that's going to offer satisfaction for me, offers lasting fulfillment in my life, then I want that. Jesus, please give it to me. Jesus, give us this bread that you're talking about. Then verse 35, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And then, come on, get this, Grace. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never thirst. Jesus says, I get it. I get it. You want fulfillment. I get it. You want satisfaction. I put that desire in your heart long ago when I formed you. But you're chasing stuff that spoils. And I have come to give you fulfillment that lasts. And if you believe in me and find your satisfaction in me, you will never hunger or thirst again. And you can imagine the people who hear that, that, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Jesus, you're, you're saying that ultimate satisfaction in life is found in nothing else but you? What a bold claim. You, you, Jesus, you're, you're saying that my job and even the, the fact that I love my job and I, I enjoy the people that I get to work with, it will never satisfy me in my life? 
it will never bring lasting fulfillment in my life? And Jesus looks and he says, yes. The only thing that brings lasting satisfaction is me, according to Jesus. And so obviously the people don't love that. They like the stuff that they do. They like the life that they live. And Jesus says, you can chase all that stuff, but it's not going to bring satisfaction. And ultimately, the people that are all around him, they leave. In fact, it says uh, that someone speaks up and says, this is a hard teaching. Who can understand it? Who can believe it? They think it's so difficult that they just walk away from Jesus altogether until Jesus is just left with a handful of people standing in front of him. And I'm going to skip some, some parts of the passage, and then we get to verse 66. And in verse 66, this is what the story tells us. From this time on, many of his disciples turned back, turned back and, and didn't follow him. And then in verse 67, Jesus looks up and he says this, you don't want to leave too, Jesus asked. He looks at the few people that remain after this difficult thing that he says, that satisfaction is only found in him. And he says, you guys don't want to walk away too? And then Peter, man, I love Peter. Peter's always the one who speaks up. And sometimes it's really good and sometimes it's just a miserable failure. But this one, verse 68, Peter speaks up. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. The people closest to Jesus look and they say, Jesus, I, I, I don't know all the stuff. I don't know all that you've done. I don't pretend to fully have an understanding of who you really are, but I've seen enough to know that there's nowhere else I could go to find the lasting satisfaction that my heart desires. Peter says, where else could I go? I've seen you, Jesus. I've seen the way that you love us. I've seen the way that you work miracles. I've seen the way that you have compassion and gentleness. And I know probably someday you're going to pay the price for our sins. Where else could I go to find satisfaction? This whole passage of scripture, if I had to summarize it for you, this is how I would say it. Now, I'll tell you, at my church, we like to take notes. And we like to take notes because we don't think it's enough to just listen. We actually think we should apply stuff to our life. And so I got a couple notes for you. If I had to summarize this passage of scripture, this is what I would say. This is what I would say. That Jesus declares he's the only one who brings satisfaction. Jesus declares he is the only one who satisfies. That there's nowhere else that you and I could turn to find satisfaction that will actually fill the desires of our heart. You might turn and you might find a moment of satisfaction, but Jesus shows up and he says, stop chasing moments of satisfaction. I am here to offer you a fulfilling life that can happen now. He is the only one who satisfies. There's nowhere else you could turn. Come on, Grace. I know you, you hear a message like this, and this is probably not the first time you've heard these conversations, that the world won't satisfy you, that only Jesus will satisfy you. And you might even say, yep, Daniel, I believe it. That phrase that you put on the screen that I wrote down in my notes or that I wrote down on my phone, I believe that. And here's what I'm here to tell you. I've experienced it personally, and I've seen enough people who declare with their mouth, I believe that Jesus is the only one who satisfies and then they turn around and chase all the stuff in life that they think will bring a little bit more fulfillment to them. They turn around and they chase the sex and the money and the cars and the women and the, and the house and the family and the whatever it is, respect from other people around us. And they think, yeah, I'm good with Jesus, but like these other things would be kind of nice too. Jesus shows up on the scene and he declares with authority that if you want fulfillment in your life, if you want satisfaction in your life, there is nowhere else to turn but to him. There's nowhere else to turn but to him. And, and here's, here's what I know. Some of you would look back and you would say, Daniel, but, but some of the things that I'm really interested in, I think they will bring joy to my life. I think they will bring enjoyment. I think they will bring satisfaction. I, will think, I do think they will make my life better. And I don't disagree with you. I think that some of the stuff that we get into in our life is going to bring enjoyment. It is going to bring satisfaction. But what Jesus shows up on the scene and says is, if you're trying to fill the God-sized hole in your heart with a car or with a career or with a relationship, it will fail you. He's the only one who can fill the God-sized hole, the God-sized longing in your heart. He is the only one who satisfies. And, and I think sometimes we can hear that and we can think, okay, well, Jesus, he's going to bring satisfaction. But, like, I know to live as a Christian, it just seems boring to me. It just seems like i got to deny myself all the time and I can't do fun stuff. And I think that's the opposite of what Jesus is saying. I think that's not what Jesus is trying to say at all. I think what he's promising them is satisfaction. And he says, I have come to bring you life. You know when you live? Right now. 
And so if Jesus is promising you satisfaction, I don't think it's some long off satisfaction that you have to deny yourself from all the stuff of the world until one day Jesus will bring fulfillment and joy to your life. I think the satisfaction that Jesus offers isn't just satisfaction for someday. I think it's satisfaction for today. In fact, that's the second note I wanna talk about. Jesus promises satisfaction and it's not just satisfaction someday. He says, I have come to give you life and I have come to give you life today. When I started my job at uh, the church that I'm at now, I started in what we have called a residency program. And a residency program is a glorified long-term internship. And um, my church does a really good job like valuing our residents and giving them responsibility and, and loving them and caring for them uh, and not just treating them like dirt. But when you are a resident, you are the lowest man on the totem pole, which means anytime someone asked for help moving in our church and I was a resident, they came to me and said, Daniel, you gotta go help this person move and you gotta rally a crew of people around you to go and help them move in their life. And so I, I hate moving just like everybody else hates moving. I hate helping people move. If you ever have a relationship with me, please don't ask me to help you move. I don't want to do it. But I had to do it a lot when I was a resident and I still kind of do have to do it. And, and sometimes I'll go and help people move and I won't actually know them. I'll show up and it'll be like a cold call. Someone will just tell me, show up to this address at this time. And one of my favorite things is when I'm helping somebody move and then I see something in like the deep dark corner of their garage that's like some outdoor hobby equipment. Maybe they've got like a fishing pole in their garage or they've got like a bow and arrow. I'm a big outdoorsman. I love fishing. I love hunting and all that kind of stuff. So if I see somebody that has that type of equipment in their, job or in their garage or in their basement or wherever, I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Now I can make a connection with this person. And so often what happens is I'll go and I'll talk to the homeowner who's moving and I'll say, oh, you, I see you got fishing poles in your garage. You like to fish? And so many times what happens is they look back at me and they say, well, I used to like to fish, but now I don't have time for it. I got too many other hobbies. I got too much going on in my life. I, I don't have enough time to go fishing anymore. And I'm always like, dang it, how could this get any worse? Now I'm helping someone move who I don't know and they hate the stuff that I hate. But I look at them or, or they would look back at me and they would say, yeah, um, I used to enjoy that hobby, but I just, I don't have time for it. My life is too full of other stuff that I can't enjoy that thing right now. I've got all the equipment for it. I've got all the right stuff. But life's too full. Grace, look at me. I think a lot of us have all the right stuff in our life to find satisfaction in Christ. But our life is so full of all the other stuff that we don't actually take hold of the satisfied life that God calls us to today. Jesus, I, I believe in you. I, I think you're right. I think you're true but I really gotta go chase this other stuff. And I don't, I don't really have time for it right now, Jesus. I, I know that you like promise that my life is gonna be okay and that like I'll be in your hands, and, 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 but I need to go chase my career. I need to go get married. I need to go make some money. But Jesus looks back and he says, I'm not offering you satisfaction someday. I'm offering you a satisfied life right now. You'll never feel the abundant life that Jesus has to offer you if you are still chasing other things to bring you satisfaction in your life. Let me ask you some questions. For you right now, what's the thing you're chasing? What's the thing that you're chasing that isn't satisfaction in Christ? Is it your career path? You know that, to be honest, if you're just chasing the career path that you're on right now because it's safe, because you'll make some money, you think your parents will be proud of you, you think your friends will respect you, but deep down inside, you know it's not what God is calling you to. You're just chasing it because you think that job and that career has more satisfaction to offer you than what Christ has to offer you. Maybe for you, the, the thing, this is kind of odd, but maybe the thing that you think will bring you satisfaction is the fact that you're not willing to forgive someone who's done something to you. Maybe you think, man, if I can just get back at that person or if they finally get what they deserve or if they get to experience what they did to me, then I will feel satisfied but don't you know that the bitterness in your heart will never satisfy you? That forgiveness is actually the way forward. That what Jesus has to offer you is not just some feeling that like, oh, finally, I can, I can, they can experience what they've done to me. Jesus looks and he says, no, 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 come and follow me and I'll heal you from that and I'll satisfy this going forward. Maybe for you right now, the thing that you're chasing is a sexual relationship. Maybe, maybe some of you today, you think, if I just marry him right now, what's the big deal? But deep down, you know your relationship's not honoring to God. You, you just think that the way you want to do it is more satisfying than what God has to offer. And Jesus shows up and he says, no, no, no. I'm the only one who satisfies. 
I'm the only one who will fill the longings of your heart. Stop chasing everything else. Jesus says, I alone will satisfy, and I won't just satisfy you someday. I'll satisfy you today. But Jesus doesn't just offer satisfaction for today. He offers satisfaction tomorrow. He offers satisfaction tomorrow. Jesus says, I have come to give you bread and bread of life that does not spoil but lasts on into eternal life. Jesus says, don't work for food that spoils. I have come to give you food that endures to eternal life. The satisfaction, the satisfied life that Jesus has to offer you is not going to end. It will carry on into eternity. Let me tell you a, a one known like Grace College story during my time here uh, at Grace. My friends um, in town, their, their family, they grew up here in Winona Lake and their family owns Speed Rocket Fireworks here in town, fireworks store. And there was one summer I decided to stay at Winona Lake after um, the school year ended and I got to hang out with those friends and their family and all that kind of stuff. And when fireworks season rolled around, um, their parents, because they owned a fireworks store, they would put on a fireworks show for their friends and family. And so I got invited to this fireworks show just before the actual fireworks season started. And when I tell you I got invited to a fireworks show, it's not like what we commonly experience of a fireworks show where like the fireworks are like they are launched on the other side of the lake and we watch it. We were in a parking lot and commercial grade fireworks were exploding over my head. That's what this fireworks show was. And I'm sitting there never having experienced anything like that before, sitting on the parking lot of Winona Lake Grace Brother and Church, looking up, fireworks exploding over my head. I'm in awe, and I'm also like afraid. Every time one of those things goes off, my chest is like hit with the impact of the concussion. And I'm sitting there, and I'm literally so afraid that I'm in tears. I'm crying in this parking lot. But I'm also like, it was the most euphoric thing. The fireworks were so beautiful and I'm sitting there enjoying it, but I'm also crying. I literally started laughing out loud because I was enjoying it and tears were coming down my face. And I was just like, praise God, it is dark right now. I do not want my friends to know that I'm sitting here with tears in my eyes and laughing out loud. I felt like the Joker, Joaquin Phoenix and the Joker just laughing randomly in public. The bright colors, the explosions, it was so visceral. I just, I really couldn't believe that it was happening. I felt so many emotions. And in this parking lot full of people with fireworks exploding over my head, the thing that I was thinking was, I don't want this to end. I don't want this to end. I want to keep experiencing what I'm experiencing right now. I just don't want this to be over. It was one of the coolest things I've ever experienced. And then the firework dad yelled out, last one. And I watched the last firework go up in the sky and explode. And the show was over. I felt so much like euphoria in this experience. But the experience ended. The experience was over. I, come on. I, I don't know what you're chasing. I don't know what you think you're going to find fulfillment in. I don't know what you think is the next thing that's going to satisfy the longings of your heart. But I do know it will end. I do know that if it's based on anything in the world, it will come to an end. But Jesus comes and he says, listen, I have come to bring you life that endures. Satisfaction, not just for today, but for eternity. If you find your satisfaction in Christ and you believe in him and you build your life around him, he will bring you satisfaction. And look at me, the satisfaction will not stop. The satisfaction will not end. Jesus' promise for us is that his satisfaction and only his satisfaction is the only thing that will last and echo into eternity. Grace, what are you chasing? Don't play games. The stuff the world has to offer you is not going to satisfy the longings of your heart. Jesus shows up in John chapter 6 and he says, if you want fulfillment, I'm the only thing that satisfies. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for this college. I thank you for these students. I thank you for the administrators and the staff that, that do such a good job of, of sharing your truth with students. Father, I, I pray this morning that more than anything, the students in this room, the families of, of potential students, that they would really wrestle with where are they trying to find satisfaction in their life. And God, I pray you would just make it abundantly clear that there is nowhere else they could turn to find the lasting fulfillment that only you have to offer. God, I pray that these students don't waste their time. I pray they don't waste their life. I pray that they seek the satisfaction that you have to offer and live their life in such a way that knows that there's nothing that they could ever be given that would be more satisfying and there's nothing that could be taken from them to, to, to diminish your satisfaction. Father God, we love you. I'm so thankful for what you're doing here at this school. Would you bless these students as, as they go throughout their day? So in your name we pray.
Amen. Thanks, Grace. You guys are dismissed.